Oh, it's recording. Dave, it's recording. I think I start all my recordings going, wait, is it recording? It is recording. <laughs> um, and then I start all of them also acknowledging that I always start all of them that way. So I, I need to get a new shtick to, uh, <laughs> to get these off. It's miracle recording in the top left corner. Like uh, I, didn't know. I heard a little bing. That's what I thought all I was going to get. But now I've got a little light flashing. So I'm good. I, I yeah. Know. Yeah, so we, uh, people may be watching this, uh, they may be listening. So normally, this is an episode of the Achieve Your Goals podcast. Uh, this is a conversation with my, uh, my friend, uh, my mentor, my uh, confidant, uh, is confidant the right word? And uh, my co-author of, the Mir- of Miracle Morning Millionaires, What the Wealthy Do Before 8 a.m. That Will Make You Rich. This is Mr. David Osborne, and uh, he's been, we've been trying to do this for a week, and he's been sick, man. What, what's been good? So David, so million, millionaires still get sick? Yeah, you know, I, I like to say that I'm one of those guys that never gets sick, but I can't say that for a couple of years because yeah. I just got sick. My wife got it first, then my daughter. I think my son had it, but he's on breast milk still, so I think he's got a lot of immunities. He had it very quickly. But I, but the sad thing, how was the day I got it, I was like, oh, no, my wife was sick for two weeks, and she's tough. So that means it's at least two weeks, no matter what <laughs> I I kept getting that false hope. I'd feel a little better. I'm like, it's going away after three days. And then that evening, I'd be like, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah. ha. So now I'm finally feeling good today after like nine days. It's just ridiculous. It's, it's, it's so annoying to be sick. No one I, wants to be sick. And I try to look after myself really well so I won't be sick. Yeah. Here I am just like everybody else getting sick. I know. I, I used to always, same thing. I'm, I'm not, I used to be one of those people that never got sick. And uh, it's, you know, that badge of honor that you wear. And then, uh, and then I got kids and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they bring home so much crap, you know, the other, and then you blame it on the other, it's the other kids at school. It's their fault. They're getting my kids sick. And then my kids are getting me, me sick. And you know, well, they don't just bring it home. They culture it and develop it and it, it grows on them. And then they bring it to you and you can't just, cause there's germs all around us all the time. Your body fights off 99%, but the kids really do. Uh, they give the germs a good, a good host to come bring to us. Yeah. But say lovey, no big deal. No big deal. No big deal. Well, hey man. So uh, I'm excited for the conversation today. Uh, this, yeah, what prompts this conversation for everybody watching and listening right now is the book that I am holding up on the video. David, you have your copy to hold up. Yeah. Two copies is better than one. Uh, so Miracle Morning Millionaires, What the Wealthy Do Before 8 a.m. That Will Make You Rich. And uh, David, uh, for those of you that don't know David Osborne, I've, I've interviewed David before on the podcast. So uh, you've, you know, if you've listened to that episode or uh, have we done, is this our second or third episode, you know? Second. We've talked second. about it a lot of times. That's why you think it's the third, but this is our second. Yeah. It feels like the third. Um, but uh, no, right so too. gosh, who knows, but I think it's the second. Yeah. I, I, well, I met David uh, back in, uh, I don't even know, a few years ago. I don't know the year. But a few years ago, I was just speaking at a, a, a nonprofit event uh, for One Life Fully Lived. And uh, one of the speakers that people kept talking about was David Osborne. And I did not know who this guy was, and uh, which he doesn't like hearing that. He's like, hey, you don't know who I am? No, but I didn't know who he was. And, uh, and I, but people kept saying, like, he's the highlight of the event. And they were so excited, David, to hear you speak. And uh, right away, you, you, you captured my attention and you captured it with um, your authenticity. You know, I think that's what attracts people to you is I think. And I think that's why, you know, I, I personally, I, 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 it's a value of mine. And, and so I think that that, that attracts me to you. Um, but also it was your transparency. You know, you, you have a high level of expertise when it comes to building wealth. You're, you know, you're a, a, an expert at that. You've done it at a very high level. And, uh, when you gave your message, it was just transparency. It was, you literally told us where every dollar came from and it was not in an egotistical way, but it was, and there were a lot of dollars, by the way, there was, I think 70 million of them, you know, back then that was, I think in terms of your net worth, but you, you showed us where they all came from and it wasn't in an ego way. It was really here, here's, so you guys can see what this looks like and that you can learn from it and that you can apply it. Yeah, and it's a take it or leave it kind of thing, How I do get, you know, some people go, oh, he's just talking about his money. But really what I am trying to do is what you got. And I'm glad you got it because I get a lot of people go, man, thank you for your transparency and honesty. And people are, other people are like, man, that guy just talks about his money. But the reality is I always try to think if I was in the audience and I wanted to be rich, which That's I did it. when I was a kid, I'm like, don't, don't sugarcoat things. Show me how you did it. That's what I want to know. So the level of openness I bring can be a double-edged sword on me sometimes. Um, but really I just brush that part off. If you really want to know what's going on, I'm a guy to talk to. If you want me to give you some speech and hide really what's going on, then, then I'm not your guy. And sometimes it comes across as arrogance, but I never intend it to be that. I just try to be 
transparent so you can see what happened, what went right, what went wrong, and how the numbers grew over time. And so you took it well, and a lot of guys come up to me and say, that was amazing. And then a few others will be like, ah, you just like talking about money, which I do. So it's- <laughs> Yeah, no, and, I, and I, I can relate. I feel the same way. It's like you, you, you have to talk about your accomplishments if you're going to teach someone how to accomplish you know, if they're trying to learn from you. I mean, I think it's really important. Um, so, uh, so the funny part is, is, you know, you've been, you've been bugging me for, and I say that in a, in a respectful, nice way, but for, for the last couple of years, like, dude, we should do a Miracle Morning book together. Right. Right. And, uh, but I never, I didn't know which one we would do. And I always kind of, I felt bad because I'm like, I'd love to, but I, I don't know which one. And I don't remember the day, but it just, uh, Miracle Morning Millionaires was a title that I thought of like five years ago when I first thought of the series. And, um, and yeah, it just, I, one day I was like, it was one of those, you know, falling asleep, taking a shower, like just the moment where it hit me. And I went, wait a minute, Miracle Morning Millionaires with David Osborne. I'm like, that would be perfect. He's like the most qualified person to do it. And, you know, something I said in the introduction of the book is that, uh, you know, wealth is, is about, in my, in my opinion, and we share this belief that it's really about living in alignment with your values. When somebody has true wealth, it's that they're living in alignment with their values and only one of those values is about money, right? right? Like one of them is about, yeah, financial freedom and money, but the others are about family and about health and about, you know, relationships, friendships, et cetera, and, and, and mindset and all of that. And, and that to me is what you embody. And so, yeah, man, I, I couldn't be more excited to, to bring this book to the world. It comes out on May 21st, 2018. Uh, yeah. which if you're watching this, that's probably like in a week or maybe less. I don't know. This will come out right before that. Um, and uh, yeah, so today I just, I want to talk to you honestly about, I really want to dive into your past. All right. Let's have a little, like let, lay let down me, on my couch. Real quick. I mean, I'm proud of this book, Hal. And you're absolutely right. I wanted to write a book with you for a long time. My first book took seven years and took hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it was just <laughs> so difficult. And then I met you while I was in the middle of that process. And I loved your book, that, The Miracle Morning. I thought, wow, everyone can benefit from this from the from the farm worker to the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And so, yeah, I wanted to pick up the vibe of how Hal Elrod writes books and, and the, the Miracle Morning community and what we're doing here together trying to change the world. And, and I'm really proud with the book and the way it came out. And it was so much easier. It was seven months. We had the right <laughs> team. You have excellent people in your life. We had the right marketing team. We had the right editors right off the bat. We had the right writers to help us write it. It was so much easier and such a joy to write. And then when I finally got to reading the finished product, you know, like my book, I had to re-edit the first one 14 times to get it right and, and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. This one, I was like, wow, no, this, this guy got it really good right off the bat. We've got it really good. And, and so, you know, I've read it three times now and I think it's going to make a difference in a lot of lives. And it was such a joy working with you. And that's what the experience that I wanted to have. And remember, I'm writing all these books, not to make money, but just to leave a legacy piece. And the in, impetus to originally write came from my father dying. And when my dad died, I knew he was going to take stories with him that would never come back to me that I would never get again because he was so full of funny stories and interesting stories from his time serving in the military. He was a lifetimer, uh, Green Beret, but, but I thought, well, what happens if something happens to me? I'm a pretty old guy to be having young kids. If I got hit by a bus or God forbid cancer comes after me like it came after my dad, then I thought, what would I leave behind? And that's, that's why I'm writing these books is like literally for wisdom for others. I'm not a funny storyteller like my dad was, but I have done pretty well in business and building wealth. And so that's the legacy I want to leave behind because while money is not the answer to all things in life, money makes everything easier in life. Pretty sure. much everything in life is easier, almost everything with money. The only thing that's not is your tax return every year. That's more <laughs> That's painful. Everything else is easier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it also, it amplifies your values, I think, right? Which is really neat. I, I heard one of my mentors used to say that. He goes, you know, people think money is the root of all evil. You hear all these cliche, you know, negative perceptions of money uh, or, you know, or, or people that make money, they're greedy. And he says, yeah. money just makes you more of what you are. If you're a generous person, the more money you make, the more you can give away, the more good you can do in the world, the more you can help other people, you know? And I found that to be, to be so true. And, and you are such a generous guy in terms of, you know, when I had cancer, you guys stepped up, your family, you, you, you were there for me, you delivered meals to my family every week. So my wife didn't have to cook and she could care for me. And, and you know, and, 
and so on so and so money, forth. So yeah, money, it, it equals freedom really more than anything else. Freedom to be who you are and what you want to do. And you're absolutely right. Actually, the correct quote as we put in the book is the love of money is the root of all evil. So if you're obsessed with money, that's not a great place to be. But money itself is just a tool. It gets things moving. We've built, you know, free clean water for hundreds of thousands of people around the world. We've been able to help you. It just, we've been able to do so many generous things because we have money and it just accelerates life. It's really like jet fuel for life. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And that, that was a big, uh, a big thing for me was cause I had the same hangups, you know, when I was younger of, you know, Oh, if I make a lot, making a lot of money is a really materialistic pursuit. I shouldn't do that. That's not who I am. You know, there's all these weird kind of hangups around it and getting over those, I think is the first step. So if you're listening to this, right, that's step one is get over, you know, any hangups you have on money and just realize, okay, I'm going to, you know, it's a, it, making money gives me freedom to be more of who I am. Let's go down that path. So, so let's start with your, your path, David, like what were you like growing up? Like as a kid, as a teenager, um, were you really business focused? Were you one of those, you know, you start a business at a young age or what, yeah, what so, was your mindset as a kid? Well, I was from the a poor offshoot of a wealthy family on my mom's side. So if you think about that, a solidly middle-class family on my dad's side, but on my mom's side, like the, the great uncle Ted, who kind of was my first mentor, he lived on the age acre worth a lot of money because there's not much land in England and it was in the gentlemanly part of town. And we lived in his little, um, the little cottage that the gameskeeper would usually uh, live in, in the, in the house. He let us stay there while I went to English school. And so it was kind of an interesting thing. My grandmother had no money. She was the poor side, but her brother, who would be my great uncle, was a stockbroker, very successful. And he gave me my first job working on his farm in England. And so I was kind of in this unique thing where I was the poor offshoot of a wealthy family on my mom's side, and, and I really related to my mom very well. So um, as I grew up, I was around wealth, but we as a family didn't have wealth um, hmm. in England. And then we came to America, and my dad basically was a soldier, so he didn't really make a lot of money, um, but he was pretty good at spending it. And then as we <laughs> grew up in America, uh, my mom became fairly good at real estate. So we really had nothing and then we started having something. Now, me personally, how did that affect all me? As the youngest in the family, my older brother was the athlete. My older sister was a very strong, independent woman who rode horses. So she was also an athlete, like uh, very heavily into horses. And I was just this guy. I just, I just got this feeling I was going to be good at business. Maybe because of the coaching huh. from, from Uncle Ted. Uh, what age did you start working for your Uncle Ted? At like 11 and 12. He gave me okay. weird odd jobs like collecting the eggs from under the chickens, which is terrifying. You think it sounds like a fun <laughs> job. They would pick at your hand. I remember being scared of him. And, and, uh, and then I also remember like he had this big lawn and the lawnmower would leave these, these strands that would stick up and he'd have me go pick those strands and every <laughs> 10 strands I'd get like five pence or something like that. So um, he gave me weird jobs like that. Um, but he would also coach me. And I just remember really a lot of life. I think you pick up through osmosis. He would have these big dinners in his big house on the big hill. Um, now they've subdivided that whole place out and sold it off into a lot of different lots, but there'd be 30, 40 family members. He'd sit up at the head of the table. And I always remember thinking, you know, one day I'd like to be that guy. I'd like to be up wow. at the head of the table and took taking care of things. He was like the big patriarch of the family. And I identified with it, even though I was a tiny kid, I didn't weigh much. And that became a choice in my head that I would one day be wealthy. Got it. Got it. So that, yeah. I think that, and that's, that's interesting as a decision. Like when I was a kid, I didn't have any of that. So I was in a middle-class family and didn't have anybody wealthy that I knew, you know? So, so it just, it's interesting how, and I think that that shows that, you know, you can at any, you could be, you have any childhood, right? There's so many examples of every people from all walks of life that end up wealthy. Right. And, uh, and, and it's that decision that any person makes and we make it at a, like you made it at a young age because you had, you had a model for it, right? You had a model, you had your uncle that you could look at and go, you wanted to be like him. Uh, if someone's listening or watching, they didn't have that, right. That the decision or the choice can be made at any moment. I think that's such an important, uh, I know it's one of the, in the book, you talk about the, you know, the two, the two doors, right. The two choices. Yeah, and I think, yeah, of course. And I think also as I grew up, like I didn't have the athletic piece to, to lean on. I remember, you know, it's funny, school seems to have changed a lot. But when I was in school, like the, the, the athletes, the jocks kind of ruled the school. They'd walk down the middle of the hallway and you'd step to one side or get pushed or whatever. It wasn't that big a deal. It was just part of life. And then 
But what I found is like, so I come to, I came to America and I started working construction and, and I liked getting those paychecks, man. I just enjoyed it. And I, I liked hustling at work and I was a terrible student. I was a C student. I didn't like school. I didn't like people telling me what I had to learn, but it felt like when I applied for a job, it, it was my choice. I'd pick the job and I could work as hard as I wanted to and hustle as hard as I wanted to. I had a job as a bagger and I tried to be the fast bagger in the grocery store. I, I was a bagger. What age did you start as a bagger? 15, I think. Me, How about uh, you? Uh, yeah, four, 13, I think, 14, 15, yeah, somewhere around Yeah, because so you could work construction at a younger person, but you couldn't get jobs, I think. There was an age you could sort of go get a regular job. I don't think you could at 14. I think you could at 15, but maybe I'm wrong about that. It was a long time ago. My minimum wage was three fifty two dollars an hour. What was yours? Do you remember? Uh, four twenty five. dollars Yeah, see? You're a little older than I am. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Not that much, but well, yeah. 100 years maybe. So, yeah, yeah. I, and I love that job, and I was the fastest gross bagger. I was the second fastest broke bagger in the store. And I actually um, got fired from that job for insubordination. See, I had a mouth on me and I couldn't stop <laughs> mouthing back at, at authority. And I remember when he fired me, I was like, Are you, you want me to finish the shift first? Because it was crowded and they didn't have a lot of baggers. And he was like, nope, you're, you're leaving right now. I'm like, oh, well, that's weird because like, I'm a really good bagger. Are you sure you don't want me to stick around? Uh, uh, uh. Um, but there, that was for insubordination. You know, what's sad is how I went back to that store like many years later as an adult. I was in the area I grew up in, so I thought I'd stop at the store, ordered some groceries, had the kid carried out to my car even though I didn't need to. And then I said to him, like, how do you like working here? And he said, you know, it's, a, it's an okay job. I, I just do the minimal amount I have to do and I get paid. And I said, you know, son, because when you're 50 like I am and you're talking to an 18-year-old <laughs> son or 15 sure. So I said, you know, son, the sad thing about what you told me is not that you're robbing from the store because I don't care whether you're the best bagger in the world at all. What I care about is that you are robbing your future self by not mm. working hard as a grocery bagger. Yep. You won't work hard as, as an engineer. You won't work hard as a doctor. You won't work hard as a construction worker. You're missing. You're not stealing from the store by coasting. You're stealing from yourself. And the one thing I think I always got was hustling at work. Like I would work hard at my job. Never at school, wasn't good at homework, was probably lazy with my chores around the house, um, or at least tried to do the minimal so my dad wouldn't be mad at me. But at work, for some reason, I just always hustled hard. Yeah, so you had that at a young age, which is, which is great. Another thing that I did not have that <laughs> much, much later in life. <laughs> so you weren't the fastest bagger in the store. Yeah, no, no. I, uh, I, I took beer from the store. I, um, it was my parents' store, by the way. Oh, okay, um, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, there anyway. might have been a wine bottle or two snuck out of the store. Yeah. I worked on too, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the, uh, so, so then when, <clears throat> now let's get specific. So you, at a young age at, at 11, you're working for your uncle. Um, so your mindset around money, you saw him at the head of the table, you saw his lifestyle. You thought I want this, which totally makes sense. Um, when did you believe, or was it at that point that you started to think or believe that you could become a millionaire, like specifically, you know, that, you know, that level of wealth? I would say it was more high school. Um, so I was always working. Like I would always have a job. I started a lawn mowing company right when I was late 16. I think I might have just turned 17. So I was tired of the construction. I'd gotten fired from being a bagger. So I started a lawn mowing company and I just started doing yards. And my mom was a realtor. So I got a lot of business from her. Um, and I loved that. And then I hired a, a second truck to work for me and then a third truck. So I had three and trucks. Wait, that was in high school? That was in high school. I made <laughs> nice. $20,000 as a high school kid living at home. Wow. Tax free. And not, not because I just didn't know how to pay taxes. So I apologize to, to <laughs> pay taxes for. Um, and, you know, what was funny about that, that this was 1994. When, no, when was this? This has been in the 80s, like the late 80s. Um, so my clients would say to me, like, we want you to cut our yard because your, your employees aren't cutting the yard as well as you would. So that's when I've got my first understanding of leverage and who you hire. And then one of my guys stole the truck. I was so naive. I bought him a truck. He was like a recovering addict and he was a plumber. So we started getting plumbing jobs. We were moving into these new spaces and I bought a $500 truck and he said, uh, I said, look, I'm just going to put it in your name. You just pay me back. That's how naive I was. Uh. <laughs> so I put the truck in his name immediately. And then like within a month, he was gone. He was like, gone. Gone with all the tools and the truck. Now, when you say uh, truck, are you talking about an actual pickup truck? Yeah, a little tiny truck. On the back of? Yeah, Got but the, okay. little, the little ones. Like it was an old little truck. It was 500 bucks today. That'd probably be like a $2,000 truck. Got it. It wasn't the great big Ford F-150. Sure, it was sure, sure. Down sure. from that. Little Datsun and, or something? Yeah. And he just stole it, took it, didn't even think about it. And then I remember I, I saw him driving a few years later and 
I wasn't really mad though, man, because I've never been mad about being taken from. I'd always rather be the guy that had an abundance that could be taken from than the guy that had to take, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. I loaned, well, I loaned a lot of my buddies money in high school. They'd never pay me back. I just, it just became like part of the deal. I was like, okay, so if you're going to be successful, I learned people are going to take uh, advantage of that. And that's just way better to be the guy that could afford to be taken advantage of than the guy that has to take advantage of other people. I'd really rather be me that could afford to buy a guy a truck than the guy that had to steal the truck. Does that sure, make sense? sure, sure, sure. You think you, it's just like that boat gra- grocery bagger. You think you're getting away from some, you think you're getting away with something by taking from somebody, but really you're taking away from yourself. The way yeah. you develop skill in providing for yourself and providing for your family over a lifetime pays off forever. That capacity to do more and be responsible for more and take on more I believe is what leads to uh, more and more abundance in life. So I've always kind of had that philosophy. If people stick me with a check, they think they're getting away with something. They're really just robbing themselves. Cause what I'm telling the universe is what they're telling the universe is I don't have enough. Yeah. What I'm telling the universe is I'm going to take on all these, this, this overhead and all this, you know, that needs to be paid. And therefore I'm going to need more to cover all of that. And that's always been my viewpoint is can I give more? Can I do more? Can I take on more? Yeah, when it's that that T. Harv Eker, that famous quote, right? How you do anything is how you do everything, right? Yes. That 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 bagger at the grocery store who's doing the minimum to get by is you know is is developing himself into the type of person that will do the minimum to get by in everything that he does. So, and, and and that's not to imply that I was somehow like any kind of perfect. I'm sloppy. I'm messy. There's all kinds of, but yes, you're right. The spirit I brought to work has always been a pretty dedicated spirit. Yeah, beautiful. So um, let's talk about some financial milestones for you. Uh, what, uh, what age, at what age did you first earn six figures? What age did you earn $100,000 in uh, a 12-month period? So I, I go to work. I get out of college. Uh, I get out of uh, college. So let's get, there was always working through high school and college, but those are menial jobs. I, I get out of college and I get my first job and it's, it's selling computer systems door to door, became the top salesperson, Literally had a boss, a, a female boss that would, I guess today in the Me Too movement, it would have been the Me Too movement for guys. <laughs> nice. So, but I, we didn't have any place to go then. So after a year, I just said, this sucks. Like this girl wants, she's just treating me in a way that I don't think is comfortable. So I quit that job, decided to sell all my possessions and go hitchhiking around the world with my best friend from college. His whole family had a tradition of doing this. I would have never thought of it. Um, and I would have never done it if that first job experience had been good, but it sucks. So I was like, okay you're on Rob, let's go hitchhike around the world, sold everything. And I think that's important because I, I went hitchhiking around the world. And again, the viewers might see like, you know, some nomadic, cool tra- traveler traveling around the world. But I was actually just a dorky, goofy kid traveling around the world, shy, I'd go into a bar in South Africa, and I wouldn't know who to talk to, or I'd be in like Greece. And, you know, it was so fun, but it wasn't cool fun. It wasn't no. like this amazing odyssey of Achilles and the golden fleece. It was more like a goofy kid. Just when I look back at myself, I'm like proud that I was willing to take those risks, even though I was kind of an awkward kid. Does that make sense? Like yeah, I, well, I definitely it, wasn't the cool kid. Not it like does, the I've seen pictures of you when you were younger, <laughs> so I can attest that he was not the cool kid. <laughs> I looked like Harry Potter, but the problem is Harry Potter wasn't cool back then. I had the big <laughs> black glasses, but hey, kind of yeah. like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey. That's right. Um, so I, I did that. Then I came back from that. I, I, got, um, I got another job in computer sales. They tried to sign me, have me sign an intellectual property agreement that everything I thought of, it even said, if you dream of an idea while you work for us, we own it. <laughs> so I, I got the job, filled out the paperwork. As I got to that form, I said, I can't do this. And I quit. I got up and I walked out. I was like, the felt, wow. I felt on cloud nine for, for about eight hours until I realized I had no job and I was in debt. About that time, my mom, who was a realtor, said, why don't you come work for me? And I said, I don't want to work in real estate. That's not a real job, but I'm broke, so I'll work for you temporarily while I go find a real job. And here I am, you know, heavily into real estate <laughs> 25 years later. So I got into real estate and I started selling and I found that real what estate- age, What age are you now? So now I'm, it's 94, so I'm 27. Okay. Um, I still haven't made more than hundred G's in my life. I've done well. I've always done well, but never made hundred G's first year in the business. I made 35 grand, uh, second year, I believe, you know, real estate has a lot of upside. You just got to hustle to do well. So third, second year, I think I made 60 in the third year, probably 90. Okay. And then as I'm in Keller Williams, which is a really fast growing company. Um, 
after three years in selling real estate, I was driving down the same street for the same time on the, uh, the third day, third time on the same day saying the same thing. And I was like, this sucks. I don't want to be just a tape recorder for the rest of my life. Well, the company was growing really fast. They were looking for people to buy franchises. Again, this is kind of how I got lucky in life. Um, because the company had 1200 people when I joined it, they got 180,000 a day and they were looking for franchise owners. And I put my hand up and I said, Hey, I'd like to go do that. My mom said, that's a great idea. Let's go do it together. So I went to Dallas and started opening up franchises. Nice. Um, and so to do that, so I made 90 grand, I go up to Dallas and the first thing I want to do is hire a badass assistant. I already told you before that I'd learned to leverage through those trucks, but I'd had bad choices. So one guy stole from me. Um, I was taught by a bunch of great guys. So the other lucky thing I had is Gary Keller was my mentor at the time, the author of the one thing. He's a billionaire. Billionaire, yeah. And he taught me, oh, how to hire great people and how to work through it. So many good things. So I'm going up there and I think I'm making 90 grand about that time, but I want a really kick ass assistant. And the assistant I find, I budgeted 25K. She wants 40K. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to hire. I know she's what I want, I've done all the process. So I'm going to hire you. I'm going to pay you 40 K. So I took a pay cut myself. So I'm now from 90 down to the difference would it be 50 and I'm down to 75 K. So I'm making 75. My assistant's making 40, but it was a game changer for me. She was amazing. And we started selling franchises, buying franchises. And within two years after that, I broke a hundred. Nice. So you were thir early thirties then at that yeah, point? Probably around 31, maybe 30, maybe the year I turned 31, and I think I made 125K. But remember, what I was doing was opening franchises. So I opened my first one up there in 97, and then another one in 98, and then another one in 99. So that's, so I'm turning 30, um, 31. And what happens with these franchises is uh, it's like planting trees. And one of the things we talk about is planting multiple opportunities for, for passive income. And as they grew and started taking root, uh, the first one was 95, 96. 97, 98, 99, two in 2001, all of these franchises started doing well. And when they did well, um, you know, I think I got a little bing in the background there just because of that. As they did well, my <laughs> went through the roof very fast. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right on. So, so early, so early thirties when you hit hundred K. So for any been, yeah, 31, 32 is probably <laughs> It was a long time ago, but any millennials listening, right? They get, you know, if they're like, wait, why well, I haven't, I'm, I'm already 21 and I haven't made six figures and I've been doing internet marketing for two years, right? It's like, Hey, you got, you got time, you know, we well, have to get time. a little lucky too. Let's put it this way. You have to hustle. You have to, you have to, uh, you have to, it takes time and you have to get a little lucky, but you'll never get lucky if you don't put yourself in a position to get lucky. Yeah. I mean, you'd written a book before the miracle morning. It didn't do as well as the miracle morning, but if you hadn't written eat the first book, you wouldn't have led to the second book and you wouldn't have gotten the, 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 the connection with humanity that you've gotten through the miracle morning. So you got to keep putting yourself out there. That's what I'd say to the young people and don't get frustrated by the lack of success. Honestly, Al, if I'm really looking back at it, those early years were more fun in many, many ways than, than being massively successful because it's sure. all on the line, right? Yeah. When it's all on the line, you're fully engaged. You're fully living. It's like going to a foreign country. When you go to like drop yourself in Egypt at the, at the, at the pyramids and you're fully engaged and fully alive. And, and so is the same is true when you launch a business. If it's just you, you're all in, you're an entrepreneur, man, you are fully engaged. I was working as hard as I've ever worked. I was reading more books than ever, going to seminars, just trying to change David Osborne to be the David Osborne that could be massively wealthy. And that's the one thing we hit on the book a lot you have to change yourself. There's no way that the me of today even is prepared for the wealth that I'm planning to have in the future. You just yeah. have to keep changing you. It's like you're the foundation of what can occur. And if you're that young millennial out there hustling and doing internet marketing, if it's not come to you yet, you haven't become yet the right person for that to show up for. And yeah. you've got to keep working and tinkering on yourself. And as you get that right, then everything will fall in place in the outside world as well. Well, and like you said, in terms of, of you've got to get lucky, I, 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 I don't think there's a single successful person on the planet that can't point to many lucky points along their journey, but it was being the right person in the right place at the right time that allowed that luck to transpire, right? And it, it's yeah. that, that the harder you work, the luckier you get. Preparation um, was, meaning opportunity is the one, right? So you're yeah, prepared exactly. and then the opportunity shows up. And then there's a million other people that luck shows just kind of like, it's like the love, like the likes on Facebook live, like the opportunities flowing right by, but they're not taking advantage of it because they're not prepared. You have to be prepared for that opportunity when it shows up. That's the part you have to do. If you prepare, 
luck will strike, find you. Yeah. Uh, Richard Branson told me the same thing. He said, everyone said I got lucky because I got out of the record business right before it crashed and I got into the airline business. He said, and I did get lucky. Um, but you have to be, re- you have to put yourself in a position to get lucky. And I think the other piece that goes along with that, and I, I think it was Will Smith that I first heard say this, which is that it takes, uh, t- it might've been somebody else, but 10 years to be an overnight success. Yeah. And I think that's so true. You know, I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was, so when I was, I started to think I could become a millionaire when I was 19, I started selling Cutco, my income skyrocketed and I went, wow, this is crazy. I, you know, like, it, it, and I'm doing, I've got the calculator out going, if I sell X amount of knives and do X amount, right, I could, I could actually get there by the time I'm 25. Yeah. And then I get to 25 and I don't have a hundred grand saved, let alone a million. And I go, okay, by the time I'm 30 and then, you know, it still wasn't there. And then, and then I kept moving the, moving it back. But, um, the idea that being patient, working hard, staying focused, and realizing that when you finally, you could probably, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but when you finally get to the point that you've been working so hard for for so long, and while you were get, trying to get there, it was usually with this anxiety and this, oh, I'm not where I want to be, and so-and-so is, and I, why, why isn't it happening faster? When you finally get there, you take a breath and you go, the, the, I, I don't wish it would have happened any sooner. No. It was, it was perfect. The journey was, was perfect. perfect. Why did I stress myself out for the last 10 years? to get here when I could have just enjoyed the process and realized that I didn't need to do it now. I could, you know, it can happen when it happens and being at peace with that is so important. Well, that's the beauty of being further down the road is you could look back and like I said earlier, you realize that that time of striving was the most fun time. There's sure. not a guy I know or a person I know, that, a lady that I know that's successful in business that didn't, when they look back on it, love the time that you're in when you're struggling and fighting. They go back and that, that's what made me who I am. And yep. every single I struggle I had, every single failure was critical to me being the person I am today. In fact, I, I would say today, it's almost like I'm, you, who, no one wants to fail, right? But the successes don't really teach you anything. It's the failures that make you the person that's capable of dealing in bigger and bigger failures. So it, it, what's that Jim Rohn quote? Don't ask for an easier life ask for greater capacity because when you have greater capacity, the world will give you more complicated problems. And when you're given more complicated problems, you tend to have a more successful life and you don't get there literally without the failures. And I had a big failure like a year and a half ago, a relationship didn't go well in a big business I thought had huge designs for didn't go well, but, and, and it was tough. You know, a year ago I was in some emotional pain and struggle and the foundation that that created has given me the opportunity to launch a, another business that I'm really excited about. And I don't think I would be able to do it if I hadn't had that first failure. Gotcha. So everything builds on it. And the great thing about being older is I knew that. I even knew it when I was in my down moments. Um, and so there, it was easier to see the light. The first couple of times you get hit by those failures, it's much more painful. So I remember my, my, my failures in my uh, early 30s and 20s um, were much more painful. and I. I was in the dark night of the soul or whatever they call that. And I couldn't see the light as well. Now when stuff hits me, I'm like, yeah, this kind of sucks. But I know that in the future, I'm going to be stronger, better, wiser because of what just occurred. And so yeah. I'm kind of almost grateful for them. Yeah. No, on the, on the other side of our adversity, right? If, if we take it head on in a yeah. positive, proactive way and, and, and where growth is part of it, then we're, we're better. Like you said, there's a better version of us on the other side of it. And, and you're such a testament to that. You've had so much adversity and you've just always handled it like such a champion. One of the things I respect, admire about you both most and why we're good friends, because I, I, I just love people that whatever happens, you can cry, feel sad for yourself, deal with it. But at the end of the day, you are the only one that can deal with it. And you've always been a big proponent of that, um, you know, unwavering faith and extraordinary and effort, extraordinary effort. And just, that's what you are. You represent that. So that's what I admire about you. And that's, you just have to face your challenges and walk through them. And then in the future, you in many ways, you'll be grateful. And one thing I noticed about you, since you've been through what you've been doing, you already grabbed life big, but now it seems like you're grabbing every opportunity and every moment to live a fantastic life. And that's what I've noticed in you. And I was actually talking about, about a friend the other day who's also very successful. And they're like, maybe we should both learn from Hal. That's the conversation. Because <laughs> yeah. you're willing to say no to this. So you can say yes to this. You've gotten better at your boundaries. You're sure. really selecting what you want to do instead of letting it override you. And when I saw all that, I was like, again, you, are, you faced it. You, over, you, you overcame it as much as we as humans overcome anything. And now you're learning from it to live a more fulfilled life. And we're all learning right alongside you. And that's, that's the best thing about being a warrior and a hero is you face that stuff. And when you get back up, everyone around you learns from it as well. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. 
Um, and I, yeah, man, I mean, it's, it's mutual. The learning is, is flows both ways between us for sure. Um, so one other question uh, on the, uh, the financial milestone for you. Uh, so hundred K in a year, uh, you made when you were early thirties. Um, and it took you a long time. Yeah. It took you quite a while to get there, but you kept, you know, you opened market, you opened franchises, right? I mean, you, you were working, moving forward and you weren't looking for what I like about that, by the way, is you, you picked one thing and you focused on it, right? You picked real estate, you focused on it. You realized that opening franchises, they were planting seeds that would grow into more income for you, right? You focused on that um, and, uh, and you took your time with it. You kept moving forward, you opened one franchise, then you opened another, then you opened another, you know, right? In the same way that I published a book and then I, and it didn't go well, so I published another and right. I kept at it until, you know, until I finally got there. Um, when did you finally, uh, when did you become a millionaire? When did you, at what age, how long did it take you from earning that first six figures to actually where your net worth was a million or you had earned a million dollars in a year or, you know, whatever came first? Yeah. So I, I, you know, the assets again, uh, uh you've got to a focus, go deep, put yourself in a position to win, get lucky. Um, and then you've got to have assets. The only way you're a millionaire is when you have a million dollars worth of assets. And so the great thing about opening all these franchises was that as they grew, they had a multiple. You could sell them. They have a, a value exit. So I would say that by my mid-30s, probably 35, I was definitely worth a million dollars on paper. And hmm. I was making by then hundreds of thousands of dollars. And again, the, the thing that, because they all succeeded, I also got lucky because there was a real estate boom from 94 till 2006. So, um, yeah, the year I finally bought my first house in 2006, <laughs> right <laughs> before was, everything crashed. <laughs> uh, I would say I was making a millionaire, and I'm not 100% certain when, but I would have to say um, uh, certainly right around 2006 would be, 2007 maybe, right around then. Got it. 13 years in the business. Uh, but all these franchises were paying me like 100 here, 150 there. Too. That's what happened is like I had all these different things paying me money. Yeah. Um, and so I would say, uh, probably around, um, uh, mid, yeah, mid, mid thirties again, late thirties, maybe 2006. How to, uh, yeah, that'd been late thirties. Gotcha. Um, one other thing that I, I want to just touch on real quick, because you, you kind of, you brushed uh, on it, which is, uh, the importance of multiple streams of income. And I've become a huge proponent. I wrote an article for entrepreneur.com a few years ago about how important is the multiple streams of income uh, for the, 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 just the fact that our, you know, our economy is so you know, unpredictable, right? Um, or or ju just volatile, if you will. And there's a lot of people that were you know, very successful, you know, had 30 years in a career, thought they were set for life, uh, and they got laid off in the last crash. And when the next crash comes, it's going to happen for millions of people again. Um, so I, because of that, I'm a big believer that we have a responsibility to ourselves, to our financial future, to our family, to have many streams of income, you know, or at least, at least more than one, but as many as we can, so that if one does dry up, we're not dependent. All our eggs aren't in one basket. Um, how many streams of income, you know, I know you're, what you're speaking of now with all these market centers, you had a handful when you were in your 30s. Um, how many streams of income do you have now? You know, it depends how you count it, um, but I would say well over 35. Some people will say over 100 because I have 100 single family rentals. So some people, a friend of mine always says, this guy has 150 streams of income. And I guess technically that's true, but yeah. I have from a pure business point of view, uh, um, probably pretty close to 35 streams of business income. Yeah. And that would include uh, putting a, a, you know, a certain number of those homes. So I try to put a million dollars worth of equity into each LLC for the single families. So I'm counting each LLC with that equity as a business more than anything Got else. It. So I have 35 paychecks that show up every month and the highest one maybe um, could be $200,000 from one business for a month and the lowest one could be you know, 10,000 or 2,500 even for the month. I mean, I just have built this you know, large range of in income producing entities. And the way people do that, like for instance, here's a couple tricks for that. I've never sold a house I've lived in, right? So every house I've ever lived in, I've turned into a rental. But mm. I also knew that going in because I was a real estate guy. So I bought those houses with rental ship in mind. So my first Got house it. in Austin, Texas, 77 grand, own it today. It's rented out for $1,200 a month and it's probably worth 295,000 a day. So that's an example. Own my house in Dallas, bought it for 270. Today it's probably worth 450. Have it rented out for 3,800 a month. Now the house I'm about to move out of, I probably will sell because the higher you go up the value chain, this house probably worth- Harder to cash flow. It won't cash flow well. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So that's one thing that I think every American should be doing, especially the millennials. When you finally buy your first starter house, um, think of it as a rental, keep it forever. Um, and then I have the multiple franchises that I built. Uh, I have, you know, intellectual property from the books that I've written. Uh, well, this will be my second one. The first book still has a, you know, a couple thousand dollars coming in a month, which isn't bad. I have profit sharing through my company. Keller Williams has a profit share program that comes in on a regular basis. Um, you know, so philosophically, uh, are you, are you in, 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 for anybody listening, what would, I guess, philosophically and strategically, what are your thoughts on multiple streams of income? Just kind of a short synopsis. You have to have it. I mean, in fact, my number one goal in life for everyone is for you to have a hundred percent of your financial needs met with, with horizontal, what I call horizontal income, which is multiple passive streams of income. income. So yeah, if yeah. you're spending 5,000 a month to live and you can generate 5,000 a month in passive income, you're free. Yeah. Freedom's what's always driven me. You yeah. can do whatever you want, whenever you want. You can work harder or you can go hitchhike around the world, whatever you choose to do. And it's yeah. not impossible to do in America. It's not really that hard. I mean, you can invest in, so if I'm looking at two investments and I'm younger, one of them is a, a future tech company that's going to replace Facebook. And the other one is a multifamily guy that's got a track record of earning 15% for his investors over the last 10 years. I'm going to tell you to go to the multifamily guy and put that money in with that guy and then get your seven or eight percent distribution every month you put in a hundred grand let's say you get seven thousand a year and then when he sells the asset you make up that extra gain i like that way more than the tech company because the tech companies all fail like 99 out of 100 don't do anything i'd much rather you took the safe base hit i like to think of myself as the ichiro suzuki of wealth because i've invested in a bunch of little multifamily deals and most of them have done pretty good and the bad ones i haven't lost much money on because real estate's a safer play then when you've got more money you can take the flyers on the facebook that's going to change the facebook because uh, so so that's what i'm talking about is like can you take your capital and turn it into 10 percent dividends can you take 100 grand and get 10,000 a year or 8,000 a year or 12,000 a year that's what you should be thinking of uh, i much prefer that or high 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 dividend stocks like there's some utility companies out you can invest in that pay eight or 9% dividends and you still own the stock. That's what you want to do is convert all your capital to cash flow until you have more cash flow than you need. And then you can go take risks. Got it. Yeah. I love it. It's about freedom. It's about freedom and, and, and having your, your, your monthly nut paid for. And then, and then you can do, you can do whatever you want. And one of the things you told me that I agree with is you want to pay off your primary residence. I think people should try to pay off their primary residence. I think that's a good move. It's yeah. not smart from a pure economic point of view, but it's really smart from a takes away all the stress of your family, takes away the risk, stuff like that. Yeah. My wife's very excited that we're, 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 we're focusing on paying off the, <laughs> paying off the house. house. Yeah. Now the, that's not the best move if you want to do what I discussed. So if you want to buy your first starter home, live in it for two or three years, don't try to pay that off before you buy your next one. If it cash flows, if you can put a tenant in it, that'll pay your mortgage, go buy a second home. And if you can afford the second home, then you've got your tenant paying off your first home. But when you get to the level of lifestyle you and I have, you cannot turn a million dollar house into a rental. It's just too expensive. You need to, sure. you need to, it's you're enjoying living in it and you need to pay it off. Yeah. Planning on staying here for a long time because David Osborne is moving a uh, uh, hundred yards away. <laughs> it's going to be so fun, man. I'm looking, we're going to build a tunnel. That's right. That's right. I wrote that in the intro of Miracle Morning Millionaires that I go at, at this rate, I said, we'll be living together soon. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go too far. Let's not go too far. Uh, we'll certainly be living together because they love each other and they'll be hanging out on a regular basis. And uh, I've always wanted to have a community of like-minded people around me, like a neighborhood. And you kind of created that where you are. You've got great neighbors already, the Nikolais. And, you know, that's, to me, that's like, can you have like-minded, capable people around you? And, and it's not like a commune. It's like, a, it's like a, just a neighborhood with like-minded people. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and helping raise each other's kids and babysit each other's kids and having like-minded parents with like-minded kids, you know, interacting and yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, all right. So let's wrap up just with, uh, this, this book, uh, in terms of what, what, you know, I mean, I think we've kind of covered it. I think we'll have an idea miracle morning millionaires, what the wealthy do before 8am that will make you rich. Um, but any, any last thoughts on the book and what it'll do for people? I'm excited to have written it with you, Hal. It's really, really good. I, I, li I like it a lot. And here's what I love about it. You cannot achieve a level of success beyond your level of self-development. And the Miracle Morning is a great tool for getting your life going, getting it started, becoming a better human being. Because you get up an hour earlier, you get that, oh, that time to yourself. I do the Miracle Morning and I was already massively successful when I read your book. But what I love about the Miracle Morning Millionaires is now we've taken it specifically from a wealth point of view. Yeah. We've added in 
being purposeful and having a goal setting template. And we've really created like, okay, if you use that hour, not just to make a better you, but to have a better focus for your day and a better purpose for your businesses, that's what we've added in this book. And so if people will get up early and get that goal setting template, we've got a, a template for everyone. Uh, and then when they're doing their visualizations and they're doing their, their, their scribing and their reading, do it all focused around their businesses they're building. Um, I think it'll make a huge difference in a lot of lives for the Miracle Morning community, for those people that want to take their life from, okay, I'm living better now. I'm, a, I'm having more fun. I'm a more complete human being. Now what can I do with that to make more money to expand my life? And I think the Miracle Morning Millionaires does that. Absolutely. What, I know you have the goal template you just referenced. Uh, what's the URL? You've got a, you're giving that away before they read the book or they can get that Anytime. for free. How does that work? So go to thegoaltemplate.com back forward slash MM. So thegoaltemplate.com forward slash MM. And you can get a free download of our goal template, which we reference in the book and we talk about. And it's really your flight path for your life. Uh, you can also get it at davidosborne.com, but I'd prefer you went to thegoaltemplate.com forward slash MM. But if they want to stalk you online, davidosborne.com is a good spot to do sure, it. Sure, sure. That's a great place to go stalk me. Awesome. Well, hey, brother, always fun talking to you, man. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful this book's coming out. I think it's going to help a lot of people on their path to wealth. And uh, I, nobody I'd rather co-author it with than you, man. Thanks. Love doing it with you, Hal. Big, big fan of yours. Love you, man. Thanks for All having right. me on. Absolutely. My pleasure. And for everybody that tuned in, uh, thank you for listening to the episode of this episode of the Achieve Your Goals podcast. Uh, and uh, yeah, man, uh, or man, woman, uh, whoever's listening, uh, this, uh, this, the Miracle Morning Millionaires book, it's what the wealthy do before ADM that will make you rich. It comes out May 21st on Amazon, audiobook, Kindle, paperback, etc. And uh, I love and appreciate every single one of you. Thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you soon.